Welcome to The World We Make, presented by the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in collaboration with live stream partners, the National Geographic Society and the Mind and Life Institute. The Center for Healthy Minds would like to thank its generous sponsors who made this event possible, including honorary host PWC, partner sponsor Steelcase Inc., ambassador sponsors Ready Set Productions, Chad Ming Tan, and Jeffrey C. Walker. Leader sponsors, W. Jerome Frouchy and the Eagle and Hawk Foundation, and each and every one of the additional 77 event sponsors. Event sponsors are creating a kinder, wiser, more compassionate world through their support and commitment to promoting well-being in themselves and others. We share our deep gratitude. At this time, please turn off all cell phones and electronic devices Recording, photography, and texting are strictly prohibited. We'll be starting the program shortly. Thank you for being a part of The World We Make. Despite all the craziness in the world, despite all the chaos that we are all collectively facing, there are glimmers of hope and extraordinary opportunities for a much more compassionate, kinder, and supportive world. I'm Richard Davidson, and I'm the founder of the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1992. That was a pivotal meeting for me, largely because he challenged me. He said to me, you've been using tools of modern neuroscience to investigate anxiety and fear and depression. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion, to study the positive qualities of life? And I didn't have a very good answer for him. And it was a wake-up call for me to begin to orient our work toward a focus on well-being and healthy qualities of mind that eventually culminated in the founding of the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds. The work that's being carried out is already having a direct impact. We're doing work in school settings with kids which we think can help cultivate healthy habits of mind and set them off on a more positive developmental trajectory. There were some opportunities for us to collaborate with the center around some research that they were doing. One of the things that collaborating with them did was afford us more formal instruction within the school and modeling for our classroom teachers who wanted to start trying out some practices with students about focus and attention and sitting, but didn't really know where to start. I'm Deb Hoffman. I'm the principal at Lincoln Elementary in Madison, Wisconsin. We do a lot of different things, from just trying to help students identify how they are feeling and giving them names for their feelings, helping them shift from calling somebody a name to understanding that they feel angry. If we teach them how to use their breath and relate to their emotions more, we're sending kids off in a way that they can cope with the larger world, hopefully a little more easily. It's tremendously gratifying to see this work actually gaining traction in the world. And I see evidence of this now every day. We also are developing curricula to cultivate well-being in adults, including teachers as well as in medical professionals. After kind of having emotional day after emotional day of worry and concern and anxiety, I started to realize that I would be running out of fuel soon. It was a problem I had to figure out. How can I find the peace or the stillness in my presence so that I could make good choices and exercise good judgment in nearly every situation that would happen 50, 60 times a day. I'm Chris King. I'm a cardiac surgeon at Harrison Medical Center in Bremerton, Washington. I knew a change had to happen. I just didn't know how, when, why, or what it would look like. I came across uh, Rishi's book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, and I was so relieved because his work was echoing everything I was experiencing on my own wow, this is real, this is scientifically based, this stuff matters, and we have proof. That just reassured me I was on the right path and that I could go all in. 
I could feel a difference in my day to day. I could feel a difference in my activities. I could feel a difference in my interactions with human beings. When you start to live life and it becomes rich for the people around you, they enjoy the fact that you're present with them and that I'm not distracted by concerns, worries, or anxieties. I'm present with you right now. People are beginning to wake up to the idea that well-being actually is accessible. We believe that the strategies that we're working with offer great potential to the world in many, many different contexts to help to promote well-being and to relieve suffering. And if we can have even a very modest impact on that, this work will have been well worth doing. Please join us on this extraordinary journey to help promote a kinder, more compassionate, and better world. Hello. <laughs> Please sit down. Welcome, everyone, to this wonderful event and to uh, greet His Holiness the Dalai Lama for his 10th visit to Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we're really honored to have His Holiness with us today. Uh, he has shared his wisdom with us uh, over the past two days uh, and we're happy to share some of those insights in this public event that is also being live web streamed through a partnership that you'll hear a little bit more about with National Geographic and the Mind and Life Institute in just a few moments. Uh, I'd like to first introduce uh, Carol Sawdai, who is the Chief Financial Officer of Price Waterhouse Cooper, uh, an organization that I've come to know a little bit over the last year through a partnership. And at the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, this past year, I had the opportunity to meet with Bob uh, Moritz, who is the chairman of the U.S. branch of PricewaterhouseCooper, and was quite impressed with their unswerving commitment to ethical leadership, uh, something that uh, we are partnering with them on uh, in, I think, very novel and creative ways. So, Carol, please. Thanks, Richie. So, as you said, on, on behalf of all of my partners um, at PwC and as PW, on behalf of the firm itself um, as the honorary host, I want to, I'm so delighted to be able to welcome His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, as well as the whole global audience here uh, to a really important conversation that we're having today and hopefully going forward as well. So PwC's purpose is to build trust in society and solve important problems. You may wonder why we would want to be here today. And it's because at the essence, we're developing high-performing leaders throughout all levels of our organization. And it's so important to us that they are able to learn, 
develop and think differently in the changing world that we're in. And we really believe that not only do our people have to have business acumen, but they also have to have healthy minds and bodies for them to thrive, deliver important and valuable insights to our clients, and to pass on that message to our colleagues as well. So we're really excited to be here to learn more about the advance, adv advancements in neuroscience so that we can apply it to our own leadership development in the future. So we're excited about being part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd now like to introduce Gary Nell, who is the president of National Geographic, through a partnership uh, among National Geographic, the Mind and Life Institute, and the Center for Healthy Minds. Uh, we've been engaged in a dialogue now for the last roughly six or eight months, uh, partnering around the idea that we can turn the central uh, issues that National Geographic has so long been focused on of exploration and geography to the mind. And uh, we had a wonderful meeting at National Geographic over the summer, uh, and we've been interacting with them since. And they are an organization that is extremely receptive and has uh, an extraordinarily, extraordinary global reach, just the kind of organization with whom we would love to partner uh, in helping to promote the simple cultural meme that well-being can actually be cultivated. So, Gary. Your Holiness, it's an honor to be here with you today in Madison. And what Richie didn't tell you is that he sold out the Grosvenor Auditorium at the National Geographic Society last Thursday night in front of hundreds of people who are deeply interested in what the center is doing. And I think we owe Richie a big round of applause for his work. <laughs> and greetings to everyone in Washington who's watching this in that same auditorium today. So we're all being streamed on camera. And uh, I also, the Mind and Life Institute, we, we have a, a great path of partnership forward in trying to work together. As National Geographic looks to use the power of science, exploration, and storytelling to change the world. And this is as much about the inner science as it, as it is the outer science. You know, I had the opportunity to uh, ask the Dalai Lama today, His Holiness, about a child being born at St. Mary's Hospital, just maybe two miles away. What would you tell her parents about the world that she is inheriting? And that's what I'd like you to think about and all of us to think about today as we listen to His Holiness's wisdom and insights. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce a very dear friend and colleague uh, who is the new incoming president of the Mind and Life Institute, Susan Bauer Wu. Susan has had a long and distinguished career as a scholar, as a researcher. Uh, she was formerly at the University of Virginia and before that at Emory University uh, and before that at the Dana-Farber Institute at Harvard. And she has been, uh, in her short time as president, uh, setting a very clear and decisive vision and uh, uh, organizing uh, the board in a very important way and steering the Mind and Life Institute so that it will have strategic impact in the years to come. And uh, it's with great delight that uh, she is here with us today and I look forward to many more years of partnering with Mind and Life and with Susan as its leader. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Richie, and Your Holiness. It's wonderful to be here with you. And to all of you here in Madison and to the many other individuals that are watching all over the world. And I'm um, very grateful, delighted that we are here in partnership with National Geographic and the Center to be able to have this very important global conversation accessible and accessible to many people. 
And as I look at our work and our mission with the Mind and Life Institute, which is essentially for us to bring together interdisciplinary scientists and scholars and people who are working in the field in the areas of education and healthcare and business, et cetera, to come together to have important dialogues and to do that across um, institutional boundaries, across disciplinary boundaries, and in the hope and the intention to promote a uh, much, uh, a world that's filled with human flourishing and great connection and looking at what we can do together. So I'm really delighted to be here and um, your holiness, Thank you for partnering with us for the last three decades, and I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'd now like to introduce uh, a very special little interlude before our dialogue. This interlude was uh, orchestrated, conducted by a very, very dear close friend, someone who also serves on the board of directors of the Mind and Life Institute and is the founder and president of the Academy for the Love of Learning, an extraordinary organization. And if you don't know much about it, I encourage you to uh, look it up, uh, the Academy for the Love of Learning in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Aaron Stern is a musician by training. He was Leonard Bernstein's last student. Uh, and he is a musician, an artist, a leader, a contemplative, a scholar, uh, and a really out-of-the-box thinker, and a very dear, loving friend. Uh, and I'd like to now uh, introduce a performance team that uh, is orchestrated by Aaron uh, and invite Hakim, Vanessa, and Molly up on the stage. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, we'd like to offer this music in honor of the Dalai Lama and to all of us creating a truly compassionate and loving world for all beings. Very excited to be here. Um, this song that we're about to perform has been written over the last three days with participation from people who've been with the Dalai Lama and um, with the, the center. And today we wanna invite you, if you feel inspired, don't worry if you don't feel like you can sing, it's okay, it's just a little bit. And um, the words are, greet the sun, listen to the light. That's it. And there's two little tiny places. We dream a world. We reach beyond, and everyone I see myself walk with me home. We dream a world. Greet the sun, 
Listen to the light, greet the sun. Listen to the light, greet the sun. Listen to the light, greet the sun. Listen to the light. At the invitation of love, we meet ourselves. And everyone we meet, I meet myself. And everyone I see, again. We have a dream. A dream for the world. A shared dream, a same dream at the same time, a living, breathing dream that is awake. Listen to the light, greet the sun. 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 Listen to the light. So I'd now like to turn it over to a very dear friend and uh, someone that you may know from ABC News, an ABC News correspondent and the anchor for ABC Nightline, Dan Harris. Thank you, Richie. Hi. But actually, let me interrupt already. And before you go... Don't make a habit of this. I won't. I just want to present His Holiness a little gift that may help today, uh, a hat that says, change your mind, change the world. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> At least... You see, it means help to protect my eye. Yes. <laughs> That's a practical. <laughs> you just changed his world. <laughs> uh, thank you, Richie. As Richie said, my name is Dan Harris. Uh, we, we now come to the sort of the, the, the heart of the matter here. We're going to have a dialogue with His Holiness. Um, uh, why am I here? Um, not only am I a journalist, but I also wrote a book uh, called 10% Happier, which is about how a, a fidgety, skeptical newsman started to meditate. Uh, His Holiness told me earlier that it should be more like 15 or 20%. <laughs> Look, I don't want to get into a math argument with the <laughs> People ask me all the time, how did you, an ambitious, at times obnoxious, uh, type A reporter start meditating. And I will admit that for a long time, 
pretty much my whole life. I believed that meditation was only for people who like lived in a yurt and were really into aromatherapy and <laughs> Cat Stevens <laughs> and John <laughs> Tesh <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, I wasn't entirely wrong about that, just for the record. <laughs> So what changed my mind? Uh, in one word, it was the science. In large measure, the science done right here at the University of Wisconsin, the Center for Healthy Minds, by a guy named Richie Davidson. I would also add that a lot of the science that was very influential uh, for me was done uh, by Richie's great friend and my friend, John kabat at the University of Massachusetts in the Center for Mindfulness. And when I heard that this practice that I always thought was sort of fringy and weird, in fact, could lower your blush, blood pressure, boost your immune system, and literally rewire key parts of your brain, I decided to give it a shot. And it changed my life. And this science is so incredibly important because in our culture, it's kind of the lingua franca. Using this science, armed with this science, you can go in and make a case to pretty much anybody that meditation is something worth investigating, which is why we're now seeing it be, being done in uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, um, uh, by athletes, including Novak Djokovic, uh, the Seattle Seahawks, who, yes, did lose to my hometown cheaters, the Patriots, a couple of years ago, but still a pretty good team. Uh, uh, we're seeing it being done at the U.S. military, uh, lawyers, police officers. In fact, I met one of the police officers here from the Madison Police Department today, who's been meditating ever since he met His Holiness um, in 1999, I believe, and said it's made a huge difference in his life. So talking about changing people's minds and changing people's worlds, that has, is what has been done here at the University of Wisconsin. I am not particularly utopian, um, but I do believe that there's a real shot at um, making a real difference in the way the world works. And, and uh, for better or worse, I've had a front row seat to some of um, humanity's less proud moments in my job. And I do think that over time it's possible, you know, if you think about past uh, public health revolutions, oral hygiene, physical exercise, they've had an impact. But this public health revolution, meditation, can have a behavioral impact. And imagine what that could do for parenting, road rage, bullying, education, politics, heaven forfend, even journalism. So uh, while I'm not uh, particularly utopian, I do believe that the work being done here in partnership with His Holiness um, has a uh, potential to really make a huge difference. And our panelists today are some of the people who are at the forefront of this effort. So I just want to briefly introduce some of the people on the stage here. You can learn more about them in your program. But at the far end of the stage, the lovely Shoma Stout, who's the executive lead for an organization called 100 Million Healthier Lives at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. She's also a primary care physician. Uh, and closest to me here, Sona Demidjian, who's a professor at the, Depar uh, at the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Colorado Boulder. Also on stage, everybody knows Richie. And next to Richie is a guy you may have heard of named His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening on the front lines of science and healthcare, and then we're going to do some questions that were submitted to us. And so let's start off with Richie. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I thought we would share this morning a little bit about the science of well-being. And uh, in order to do this, we have reflected on what we know from modern neuroscience about well-being And there are four constituents of well-being that have been investigated neuroscientifically. And I'd like to review those four constituents. It's not to say that there aren't others, but these are four that have been seriously investigated. And each of them, uh, we know something about the brain circuits that are associated with them. We also know that each of these brain circuits exhibits plasticity. And what that means is that these circuits are responsive to the forces around us. And I often say that plasticity is influenced wittingly or unwittingly. And often 
Most of the time, we have unwitting influences that are shaping these circuits, and the invitation in all of this work is that we can all take more responsibility for our own minds and brains by cultivating healthier habits of mind. So what are these four, and what do we know about them? The first we call resilience, and we define resilience in a very particular way. It's the rapidity with which we recover from adversity. How fast or slow are you in recovering from adversity? Adversity surrounds us. Adversity happens. Uh, and the, the question is, how slow or quick are you in, in recovering from that adversity? And uh, what we have observed in our research is that people vary in how quickly or slowly they recover from adversity. And most importantly, we can see the influence of meditation practice, certain kinds of meditation practice on the rapidity with which you recover from adversity. And so this is actually something that is a learnable skill. We can actually cultivate increased resilience and we can uh, recover more quickly from adversity. And we know something about the brain circuits that underlie this. The second constituent of well-being we call positive outlook. This is something that, honestly, Your Holiness, I've learned so much about from you um, because you are someone, even though you respond to tragedy in a very appropriate way, when you look at every human being, you see their basic goodness. Uh, and positive outlook is really about seeing the basic goodness in every human being. It's about the ability to savor that experience and to have it imbue, color, shade, everything that we do. Uh, and we have found, uh, we've identified some specific brain mechanisms associated with this quality of positive outlook. It's something that individuals who suffer from depression have difficulty activating this circuit. And we also find that when this circuit is activated, it lowers our stress hormones. Uh, and so it plays an important role in biology below the neck that may be important for our physical health. So that's the second constituent of well-being. The third constituent of well-being is one that we don't normally think of as part of well-being, but yet it seems to have a very important role to play, and that is attention. To paraphrase the subtitle of a recent scientific paper, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. A wandering mind is an unhappy mind. So uh, we can actually learn to pay attention. <laughs> William James, William James in his very famous two-volume tome that was written in 1890, The Principles of Psychology, has a whole chapter on attention. And in that chapter, he said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. And he went on to say that an education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. And we see in some of the simple contemplative practices, they are strategies, if nothing else, for educating attention, and the education of attention can have important consequences for our well-being. The fourth constituent of well-being that has been investigated neuroscientifically. So the first is resilience, the second is positive outlook, third is attention. The fourth is really the most important because it is the one that activates these circuits in uh, the most immediate and dramatic way, and that is generosity. 
There has been, there is a vibrant neuroscientific literature now on generosity showing that acts of generosity activate circuits in the brain which are associated with well-being. Uh, they actually, uh, these are circuits that play an important role in regulating our emotions and lowering our um, stress biology, uh, calming the mind. Uh, and so these four constituents together play a very important role in well-being, and each of them is associated with circuits in the brain that show plasticity. And this leads us to an inevitable conclusion, which is really a very simple one, and it's a conclusion around which we hope to build a social movement. And that conclusion is simply that well-being is a skill. So thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it back to Dan. And I'll turn it over to Sona. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> um, Your Holiness, it is such a honor, really, to have an opportunity to speak with you today and um, to share this amazing experience with so many people. Um, my, what I want to share today, in a way, bridges between what Richie just spoke about as the constituents of well-being and what Shoma will describe in a few moments, which is this amazing, broad, global, social um, initiative to cultivate well-being. The, what I want to talk about um, is bridging in the sense that it builds on a point that you made yesterday, which is that if we are going to have peace in our world, it requires... It requires having inner peace of mind. And my work, um, my research is guided really by one question, which asks how can we most effectively train people to develop the skill of well-being, and particularly people who are vulnerable to difficult states of mind. So today, in our brief time, I'd like to address three points. The first is to talk about a challenge, and there are so many challenges in our world today to well-being. I work in particular with people who struggle with depression, and in particular with women, because they experience double the odds of depression as men, and mothers, um, because even though many people think that depression would be incompatible with what's assumed to be, and is for many women, the happiest time in their lives, um, we know that at, at least 15% of women struggle with depression during pregnancy and when their babies are young, which in the U.S. translates to 600,000 women each year. And we know that depression during this time among mothers also impacts their children, um, both when they're babies and throughout the course of development, that they experience increased risks of problems. Um, Our healthcare system responds to this challenge primarily by prescribing medication, which can be helpful for some um, people, but what we know is that the majority of women, when we ask them what they want, tell us in surveys that we've done with pregnant women, over 80% say, given the choice, they would prefer to learn skills to address problems like depression and to stay well during pregnancy and when they're parenting their children. Which brings me to my second point, which is that we have now a lot of good scientific evidence that tells us that we can actually provide women with what they want. Um, one of the most widely and rigorously studied training programs is a synergy of mindfulness meditation and cognitive behavioral therapy called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And um, this intervention, this training, has been studied now with hundreds of people um, in many different countries. And my work in particular has focused on women who are pregnant and who have histories of depression because they have an increased risk of becoming depressed again during this time. And this um, program teaches women to counter the habits of mind that can develop, um, that tend to be caught by and 
amplify negative experiences, negative emotions, negative thoughts, and to um, begin to develop skills to pay attention to how they're thinking and feeling, to work wisely with difficult thoughts and emotions, to ask their family for help, and to care for themselves and their babies mindfully with love and with kindness. And we've learned that um, this uh, training has very important effects, that it can, in fact, increase protection from depression during pregnancy and postpartum. In fact, in a recent study that we did, only 18% of women who received this brief eight-session training experienced a relapse of depression, compared to 50% of mothers who did not get this training. And we know from other researchers who have studied the babies of mothers um, and have found associations between when mothers are more mindful during pregnancy that their babies experience fewer negative emotions um, and are better at regulating themselves. So these are just a few points from a large and really exciting um, science that's growing that tells us that supporting women during these key life transitions is good for women and it's good for the people in their lives. Which brings me to my third and final point, which is what does this scientific evidence um, tell us about how to cultivate well-being in our world today? I think one point I um, would like to emphasize is that women are powerful agents of change and allies in the effort to create a world that is kinder and more compassionate and I would say more rational. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that there are these doors, natural doors in women's lives through which we might enter with these types of training. So when women are pregnant and having more contact with their healthcare providers, when their children are in school and are receiving the types of curricula that um, your emphasis, your holiness on secular ethics has encouraged the development of training for children to reach out to their mothers so that they can be learning the same skills for healthy minds and healthy hearts and practice together with their children. Um, as you know, I'm here, what part of the meeting, the reason this meeting is so special for me is that I'm here with my daughter, Serena, who's 14 years old, and she wanted to come because your teachings have um, had such a profound impact in our world. And my hope is that um, we can together join forces um, to create a different world for her and for her generation. Um, today, one out of four women will experience depression in their life. One out of three women will experience violence, often at the hands of someone that they know. Um, mothers in the U.S receive on average 69 cents for um, equivalent work for fathers who are at one dollar of father's pay. Um, I want a world for her generation where women um, experience joy and vitality, where they feel safe and strong, where they have economic opportunity and freedom. And my hope is that when she and her generation look back on today, which follows yesterday, International Women's Day, um, that they see this as a pivotal moment where people were inspired to uh, care about inner peace of mind and the ways in which that can develop uh, peace in our world, and that this will be good not just for women and girls, but for boys and men, for plants and animals, 
for our planet as a whole. So thank you very much. Fascinating work, great presentation. Thank Thanks, you. Dan. Shoma. Thank you, and Sona, it was such a privilege to hear about your work. And you know, when I uh, reflect, and, and Richie, it's such a privilege to hear you lay out those four dimensions and the concept that well-being is a skill. You know, when you think, I have the privilege of um, stewarding along with hundreds of members and partners all around the world, um, a movement called 100 Million Healthier Lives, which is, um, he which is hosted at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, but really sits across people, communities, and organizations that have adopted this challenge of creating well-being in the world by not only thinking about, by connecting our inner world uh, with what needs to happen. You say change your, change your minds and change the world. We're wondering if we might be able to embed the process of changing our minds with changing our habits even as we try to change the world. What happens when the kind of structural issues that lead to poor health and well-being that Sona was just talking about can be addressed alongside the skill building around mindfulness uh, practice, around uh, reflective practice, as we describe the skills of le leading from within, leading together, and leading, leading for outcomes, and then above all, focusing on those who um, have the greatest opportunity for gain and well-being, um, leading for equity. And so I, as I was reflecting on this um, day and what I might be able to say in these few precious moments and what I might be able to ask, yes. Um, I found myself, um, and, and especially as I listened to what you shared yesterday about thinking about the oneness of the human family, I, my thoughts turned toward interconnectedness and what it means for us to create a movement that interconnects us even, even as we create an interconnected world. Um, and as we began to think about that, you know, it struck us as we began on this journey, which began by recognizing that on, for better or for worse, in the United States, but also in much of the rest of the world, we don't have a health care system, we have a sick care system. And to, to turn a sick care system, which was designed to address disease, to a health and well-being system, which needs to exist Which, which can't only be taken care of in hospitals, which is where people spend only moments of their time, or even in the doctor's office, where people might see uh, a doctor four times a year, but actually needs to exist in people's lives, in the community where people live, work, and play. And in the way in which we think about our society, we realize that that required a major shift in mindset. And when we looked at the literature of what creates shifts in mindset, we found something very interesting. We found that the vast majority of people who are grown-ups learn by doing something. So we said, if we want to shift our minds, how could we create a way of something uh, that's a way of doing that helps people to shift their minds even as they begin to create that connected world? As we began to do that, we wondered who else, who might be interested? Could we find the Sonas and the, and the Richies, who, all, each of whom hold a piece of the puzzle about what it takes to create well-being, and invite them to be part of putting those pieces together to see what we might be able to create together that we couldn't create alone. And as we put out the invitation, hundreds of people spanning uh, now over 10 countries around the world who collectively reach over 100 million people in this country alone said, we're in. And as they began to put their pieces of the puzzle forward, they began to create, of course, the most um, brilliant and, and clear solutions about what needed to happen. And every day, hundreds more pour in. We discovered that people had discovered the kind of, of research that you had found about what could help women who are pregnant 
um, and others had figured out how to improve um, the health and well-being of children um, in post-apartheid South Africa, or uh, to create humanism in the middle of schools in Afghanistan, or to think about how to create children who believe in possibility, who have not only resilience and a positive outlook, but the ability to know how to improve the world around them right here in Algoma, Wisconsin. And as those hundreds of change leaders brought in their hundreds of people, we began to create a connected network of people that could not only begin to put our pieces of the puzzle together to create something greater together in areas as diverse as child health and well-being, to mental health and well-being, to addressing veteran homelessness, to addressing the, the epidemic of chronic disease, we discovered that each, each person often had a solution to offer and something that they needed, that they were interconnected. One of the most strong messages that emerged that came out loud and clear is, and that came from the evidence was that we, we wouldn't truly be able to solve this, to address and create well-being, if we couldn't address equity. Because you asked about St. Mary's. In most hospitals around, our, around this country, two children born perfectly healthily who might grow up two to five to 10 miles apart might have as much of, as a 10 to 25 year difference in their life expectancy, right here in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And we began to re And as we, you know, you spoke yesterday about the responsibility we have to think about addressing that in a way that builds human dignity, even as it creates, requires unprecedented generosity. And it seemed to us that there is something in that that was so crucial to what has been missing in prior efforts to address equity, which have often come from a place of someone coming to offer a solution to someone who is thought of as, as vulnerable, as weak, as poor. So that the effort itself worsens the gap and creates that sense of, of weakness. And, and we began wondering what it would be like instead to think about the creation of equity, to look not just at the, at, at the data where, at where things are different, but to create equity in a way that builds strength and resilience, to do that in partnership with people with lived experience um, who have great insight to offer and who, if, if what could happen if the process itself created that strength and insight and unleashed their solutions to the issues of our world. And as we did that, we realized that the most fundamental value that needed to be in place was, was love. That connection of leading from within, leading together, leading for outcomes, and leading for equity, that when we had love and compassion, it unleashed new possibilities in communities as diverse as Boston, our Los Angeles, to, as, uh, to places in New Mexico and, and Wisconsin uh, and, and, and Sweden. And so my question for you, Your Holiness, is this. You know, as we think about what interconnectedness means, as we recognize the developing world and the developed world that lives inside our hearts, inside our communities, and in the world, how can we think about achieving well-being, can we achieve well-being if we're truly interconnected, if our fates are dependent on each other's, if everyone doesn't have well-being? I believe, and also telling people, 
Firstly, we are social animal. Or social animal. Even the animals, those social animals, you see, uh, no religion, no certain sort of constitution, but biologically, in order to survive each individual, by nature, see, they work together, live together. Like, I think, bees. Uh, so they have, I think, very good, sort of, I think, sense of community. We are social animals. Uh, but sometimes, I think, our self-centered attitude, me, 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 that comes with the success. That becomes more dominant. Uh, uh, so now, uh, Basically, we are social animal. Individuals, I should say, life, even life, depend on the rest of the community. Uh, and then, unlike past world, in the past, American native people, more or less self-sufficient, <laughs> no need if it's some sort of uh, cause of that interaction, no. interaction with other continent. Hmm. Like that. Now, today, the situation is not like that. Heavily interdependent. Mainly economic. Heavily interdependent. Then I think the environment issue. Also, you see, telling us, we human beings, seven million human beings, they should work together. Because of the S1. common day. No, yes, one. That's one. Now, the environment or weather telling us. Now, under that, circum that circumstances, you see, the, I think the sense of community uh, and sense of the essence of the social animal. Now, that's something now very, very relevant. So, this. I think the potential of that biologically, I think there. But now the education, I feel key thing is education. So education, you see, the, uh, should bring more awareness that that reality. Then you see this, I think, very, very, because of the very good, change your mind, change the world. World means. Uh, I think mainly human beings, combination, that's what. So change. Firstly, individual should start. Uh, individual level, not changing, not make effort to change, and expect change world. Uh -huh. It is because of that. I think. I think, because I think, I think serious ignorance, the law of causality. Oh. So things, sort of combination, humanity is combination of individual. So change must start from individual. I often used to think that way when I think the problem, immense problem which we are facing. Then think you, just a tiny one individual. The problem, huge. But then think more seriously, or more no, positive, no, realistically. No. Eh? Someone, individual, must make effort. One individual decide making effort. Other side also, one individual. One individual, is their effort, then gradually affect ten more people, hundred people, thousand people, hundred thousand people, then millions. That's the way to change. So then again, is I think key thing is awareness. So many of our sort of way of thinking, way of life is unrealistic. 
our perception and reality, there's huge gap. So suppose education is bring to closer reality and our perception. But now existing education, just talking, thinking about external values. I think almost neglected about our inner value. And also I think, in, I think in some extent, I think ignorant, ignorance about our inner world. And out of that, you see, uh, not pay attention. The inner world is just like that. No possibility to change or through awareness, through education. So now that's not begin, you see, uh, so that show or oh, there is possibility, change. Uh, even because of the physiology survey. If, even at the level of biology. <clears throat> oh, see, it really, you see, that makes clear there is not only possibility, but if you make a certain effort, certain way of thinking change, it actually immense benefit to immediately your own health. Then, the one's, one's own mind can become more peaceful. Oh, peace, not out of sort of darkness. No, oh. Not a dull kind of peace of mind. Oh. Knowing fully all the possibility of dangers or things. Meantime, say, uh, your intelligence combined with inner strength, self-confidence, self-confidence very much based on honest, truthful, that related with compassionate heart. You always look at that. Usually we Tibetan saying, uh, mother-centered being, entire-centered being considered as a mother. Nice. Whether they seriously practice or not, <laughs> we have that kind of word. <laughs> so, so, you know, look at that. As a human brother and sisters, we have to live together. And my future depends on them. Their future also some way related with my future. So the happiness of humanity is our common goal, common interest. So, of course, uh, we are selfish. Selfish is the key factor for survival. <laughs> Without selfish, so we can't survive. So selfish is good. But usually now, many years, I'm telling, we selfish should be wise selfish rather than foolish selfish. <laughs> the problem, foolish selfish, oh, just me, 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 me. And then, in order to gain me, how to exploit this person or that person, how to bully like that. That's the, the foolish selfish. You see, your happiness, your kasota, uh, successful life, depend on the rest of our brothers and sisters. So then take care and share sincerely. Then honest come, truthfulness. Then you can carry your life transparency. That brings trust. Trust brings friendship. We need friends. So quite simple. Not talking about next life. Our next life is private business. <laughs> <laughs> Well-being of seven billion human beings is our common interest, our common responsibility. <laughs> So I think mainly education, make awareness right? uh, in order to uh, know this is something. We have to look that from various angles. From one dimension, you can't see the reality fully. You have to look from various angles. So without knowing the full picture of the reality, your effort becomes unrealistic. 
So awareness is a key factor. I think we may say a lot of problems which we are facing, many problems which are selfishly created, these ultimately due to lack of awareness about reality. I feel like that. So, so do you have further argument? <laughs> I would never argue with you. <laughs> I hear you're a very skilled debater who has many years of experience. <laughs> we have time for a few questions, if you're up for it. Um, I'll ask a question, and then everybody can jump in uh, on the panel. Um, you talked about education. There's a big push in this country right now, and I believe you've been very supportive of it, to teach children how to meditate or to teach them mindfulness. However, in some quarters, this is not a popular thing. There are people who believe that, in fact, it's a sectarian push or stealth Buddhism, that these are, uh, <laughs> you laugh, but that's an actual term. Um, uh, <laughs> Given that these practices do derive from Buddhism, how are they not sectarian? Actually, I think all major religious tradition, the religion of human being, uh, I think existing all religions, not religion of God or not religion of angels, but religion of human being. So therefore, all major religious tradition, we see emphasis, importance of love. And in order to, in order to carry it, practice of love, sort of, I say, because of that, successfully. You see, also, you see, teach, uh, teach us the practice of tolerance, practice of forgiveness, practice of self-discipline. So all this, you see, the, I think all major religious tradition, you see, acknowledge we have negative sort of the destructive sort of force, emotion also there. So, so in order to bring happy individual, uh, the ultimate source of happiness is love. So therefore, the emphasis. So all major religious tradition, I feel, is the method to promote basic human value. In order to carry that, then use different concepts or different philosophical views, such as God, creator, and, and some other, say, self-creation, a different sort of concept, different way of approach but same goal. So now, uh, we are talking humanity. Out of seven billion human beings, I always mention, see, mentioning over one billion non-believers. These also are brothers and sisters. You see, we have to sort of take serious consideration about their well-being. So the method, making us aware of this inner value, if we use, uh, I think, including word of meditation, uh, they may feel that's a religious matter. I think it's quite true. <laughs> quite understandable. Oh. So simply, I usually say, because awareness, the deeper reality. Mental training. Huh? Ah. Mental training. Ah. Mental training. Is or, and, and then mental training. It's actually, I think meditation, vipassana, or shamatha, actually is meant for nirvana. <laughs> Salvation. Oh, that's the business after, uh, after this life. Hmm. So now we are, you see, 
working, making effort to create this very life so more happy, happy one, and happiness much related with mental level, not only physical level. Physical level may be uh, sort of hardship, but mentally very happy, very peaceful. I think I often use mentioning one occasion, Monsu Road in Spain, I met one Catholic monk. He spent five years in the hermit life in mountain. Very little hot meal, just bread and tea. When we met, I asked him, I already informed him about his sort of, what's the day? Life. Uh, his life, or his life. So I, I asked him, I was told you spent five years in the mountain, very hermit life, no modern facilities. And what kind of, sort of practice? Yeah, he, he answered me, meditate on love. When he mentioned that, I noticed in his eye something special, sort of significant. So that's one example. And then also you see Tibetan, one Tibetan. You see, he spent more than, I think, about 18 years in Chinese gulag. A lot of difficulties, hardship. And in early 80s, he uh, got the opp opportunity to come to India with permission, Chinese authority. So, since we know each other very well, so uh, we just casual talk. Uh, I just, you see, and then he mentioned during those 18 years, as a few occasions, he really faced danger. I thought maybe danger on his life. Then I asked, what kind of danger? His answer is danger of losing compassion towards perpetrator. The Chinese, Chinese. Chinese guards, prison guards. Is he considered practice of compassion is so important. So reduce that, he really feel it's something very serious, dangerous thing. As a result, now his age, uh, now, I think uh, 98 or something. His physical, uh, in the, uh, during labor work, remain like that. Slightly bent. Uh, <clears throat> but on face, smile, very happy person. I think during those years, as he mentioned, if uh, he l l lose, uh, lose his compassionate sort of attitude or feeling, then more frustration, more anger, then he won't live. Today, love. Uh, today. Very clear. These are something living example. So no differences as a Buddhist, as a Christians. And similarly, among my friend, uh, some Muslims also, truly dedicated. So they told me, a genuine Islam practitioner, say, must love, must extend love to entire creation, creation of Allah. Wonderful. The problem, we are sometimes not seriously practice these things, including with Buddhists also, with Tibetan Buddhists also sometimes. So therefore, sometimes uh, a new, new name, I think in dictionary, I think we should, we should add Lama politics. <laughs> so names or number of their followers, little competitions. <laughs> So even you see, uh, if, so, suppose these people is a practitioner, but not serious enough, sincere enough. So negative emotion still find some rooms. I think follow of all major religious tradition. 
uh, I think should, should be more serious about practice. Then all have same potential. Then again, you see, look. So, so I think the very word meditation is something close connection with ancient Indian tradition. Although you say, I was told some Greek Orthodox practitioner in Greece, some island, you see, they still carry meditation, I was told. So, so in any way, generally, I think meditation, this word, is to come from Indian tradition. Uh, Indian tradition. So maybe better to use uh, awareness or, or Kazoda, pay more attention. Sort of attention. So that is training of mind, like that. Thank you. But, 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 you know better. Don't, don't overestimate me. Um, so, so let me I, uh, let, let me ask you, since we're on the subject of, of kids, um, uh, I have a one-year-old. What is the right age to teach him mindfulness, and will it stop him from pulling the cat's tails and eating their kibble and drooling on me and pulling the pages out of my wife's magazines? I love watching I think as a, as a father, I think you know best. <laughs> so that I should take that to mean you're not going to answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, basically, your child uh, is a human being. I think really, I think seven billion human beings. The same when we're born, same potential. When we're grown up, same potential. Then we must nurture that. So showing sort of Kasoda, unconditional sort of affection. Love, love. Ka, love, love. Unconditional love to the, ch to the child. And then I often see telling people uh, that also I learned some experience to sort of experts. You see, mother's close touch with child is very essential. Spend more time. Uh, then mother's own milk, feeding mother's own milk, very essential. So, so these are the, I think, real method to nurture these basic good human, good, human good quality biologically uh, process. So then eventually education should include the education about inner value, strictly based on scientific finding, not ancient sort of uh, books, scriptures. Then, then I think the, within my lifetime, difficult to achieve. But your child's, I think, life, lifetime, I think the real possibility to see better world, more compassionate, peaceful world, peace through inner peace. Unless inner peace, impossible to, to create real world peace. World peace will not achieve by weapon, by anger, by suspicion, by hatred. World peace can achieve only through loving kindness, respect, others' life, and take serious concern their well-being on the basis of sense of oneness of seven billion human beings. I think, I think that is something I feel realistic. Like that. <laughs>
<laughs> As Sona's work uh, illustrates, yeah, having uh, inner peace uh, during parenthood is difficult. Um, at, shortly after we had uh, our first baby, uh, I found myself in the middle of the night holding this screaming beast, and there was like poop everywhere. And I thought, the name of my next book is going to be Everything in My Last Book Was Baloney. <laughs> Let him translate that. <laughs> I got him. So that is the, if may I say so, that's the indication of your sort of experience of meditation, still initial stage. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had it confirmed in front of a live web audience <laughs> that I'm a terrible <laughs> meditator. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good moment to change the subject. Uh, we did solicit a, a number of questions from uh, uh, National Geographic and the Mind and Life Institute. We're running out of time, so I'm just going to ask one. Which is a really interesting question, and it gets to what you were talking, you're, you were speaking about earlier, your wholeness, when it comes to the ways to achieve world peace. Um, and this is a pr pretty serious, heavy question. It's from Elizabeth W. from Wallen, Tennessee. And she asks, how would you teach us to deal with people like ISIL or ISIS who are ruthless and attacking others by such savage killings? And I guess a related question, and this was addressed in Danny Goldman's, Daniel Goldman's excellent book uh, um, about, um, about you and your vision for the future of uh, Force for Good. Um, do you ever think violence is justified and legitimate? That's very difficult to say, uh, but some sort of harsh word, a little bit sort of, because of the harsh responsible. harsh responsible, out of sense of concern, sense of compassion, sense of concern of their well-being, sometimes possible. A little bit sort of harsh word, s some, some sort of the, sort of the tough harsh, responsibility. Oh, of tough responsibility. Tough responsibility. So, then, that's difficult to say. I, I think, in any way, I think right from the beginning, this much better avoid violence. Violence, one start, no matter how it's good purpose or good motivation, because of intention. Then, you see, it easily becomes out of control. So, much better. Avoid violence. The best way, through talk, through dialogue. These troublemakers, also human beings, human brothers, sisters. I think deep inside, they also have the seed of compassion. Uh, so, so respect that value and talk. So I often use it telling, uh, in order to create this 21st century, peaceful century, uh, peace does not mean no longer any conflict or, conf or any potential of conflict. So, con potential of conflict always there. So, the, whenever you see some potential of conflict about to come, and then through talk, through dialogue. So, therefore, this 21st century should be century of dialogue. So, that's the only way. The violence. There's a Tibetan saying that if you find a hole where you can you know, um, a poke with a needle, then you can also make sure that you can poke with a pen you know, afterwards. So violence, initially, your intention may be a very limited use of violence, but it opens up a door for a much bigger violence. I think it is in my whole life, I think witness uh, Second World War, uh, the uh, civil war in China, 
And then we had more Korean War. Then after now, now 80 years old, 81 years old, but still quite sort of, quite, 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 quite a lot, you see, violence, conflict. conflict. If this situation remains continue, I think, this century, I think, again, become a century of bloodshed. That we must avoid, or must make an attempt, effort, to bring this century, unlike 20th century, this 21st century, must be century of peace, century of non-violence. Through our effort, not through prayer, I think a thousand years, the Buddhist as well as our other brothers, sisters, special brothers, sisters, pray, 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 pray. But I think <laughs> fail our sorrow because of that. Aspirations are uh, it, prayer. Uh, the result of prayer, world peace, or a happy human being. So now, I often used to telling half joke, if we have the opportunity of seeing Jesus Christ and Buddha, you ask, please bring peace on this planet. Then uh, Buddha and Jesus Christ may tell us, oh, who created the problem? <laughs> <laughs> if God creates problem, then we can ask God, please bring peace. But problem we start. So we have the responsibility is it to, to solve or to reduce. So. I really feel that. So we have to make effort. And then with our own effort, tireless effort, with sincere motivation, seriousness, and because of the clear, because of the understanding about the reality and short-term consequences, long-term consequences, and plus prayer, then I think very realistic. <laughs> Your Holiness, we're just about out of time, but it's been a pleasure to be in dialogue with you, and I promise to work harder at my meditation. <laughs> <laughs> and on behalf of the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin, National Geographic and the Mind and Life Institute, I'd like to thank Shoma and Sona and Dan and Jimpala and Your Holiness. Thank you so much for returning to Madison. Safe travels, and we look forward to a return. Thank you. Last, you see, a few days, my sort of was the meeting people here and some other places. There's more and more people really showing enthusiasm about these inner values or these things. So that gives me tremendous sort of enthusiasm, encouragement. Ah, encouragement. So thank you very much. Thank you. This is Sona's daughter, Serena. Sona's daughter, Serena. Sona's daughter. Thank you. <laughs> First to daughter or mother? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You sure I deserve one of these? <laughs> oh, certainly. Certainly, certainly, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> From Bengali, <laughs> traditionally very close of relation, Tibetan and the Bengali. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you.
It's a pleasure to watch you translate your mind. To script, but...